In this unit, we will talk about interpersonal skills. This unit will help you learn about dealing with other people to succeed in management and to gain an awareness of the interpersonal skills of others that help in dealing with work tasks we are responsible for. To gain skills in dealing with work tasks we are responsible for. After studying this unit, you should be able to recognize the importance of interpersonal skills. Describe how good communication with other can influence our working relationships. Outline the roles we play in our work groups and teams. Communication. The basis of good communication seems very simple. It is speaking or writing clearly such that any message you, the sender, intend to send to someone else, the receiver, is exactly the one which they receive. This include that the message should have a detailed content such that the language used should be appropriate such that the receiver might not misunderstand phrases we used. We must also be aware of the way we deliver the message also known as the medium. For example, can the message be conveyed by phone or email or does it require a face-to-face -face meeting with the receiving person? In terms of your own communication skills, it is important to give just as much of your attention to a message you are receiving as to one you are giving. Listening, for example, as well as being a method for gathering information can convey your interest in what the other person is concerned with. This in itself can have a positive effect on your relationship with them and, if you are their manager, their motivation. Asking questions for clarification of the detail of the message can also convey that you have understood the message and that you want to respond to it appropriately. In reality, a message like the one just referred to above is just one of many which forms part of the ongoing relationships we have with the people we work with. How we get on with each other can have a huge impact on the interpretation of a given message and the subsequent effects that might have on their motivation or morale. The next idea we will introduce is a framework for assessing how relationships are established and evolve based on the states of mind of those involved in it. It is rooted in the work of psychologist Eric Byrne from an idea proposed in the mid-1960s. Byrne argued that everyone goes through shifting states of mind or ego states, as he called them, based on the circumstances they find themselves in and the responses they have developed over time to these circumstances. There are three basic ego state, parent, adult, and child. Basic ego may be defined into three states. Firstly, parent state, as the name suggests, is associated with the typical behavior of a parent towards their children. This behavior could be authoritarian prescribing or admonishing, as in, don't do that, do it this way, or that's wrong. It can be described as a critical parent state. It can also be a nurturing parent state. This include being sympathetic, protective, or cosseting. Secondly is the adult state. It is where the individual focuses on gaining better factual understanding of a situation by adopting a calm, rational, objective behavior. Someone in this state of mind will tend to ask questions and check their understanding with the other people they are communicating with. They will come across as thoughtful, inquiring, and balanced.
and finally the third one is child state. It is associated with a variety of behaviors thought to be childlike. There exists three possible child states. First, we have the three child state where the behavior is associated with creativity, spontaneity, and fun. Then, we have the rebellious child state. As the name suggests, it is associated with hostility, defiance, and argument. Last, we have the adapted child state. In this state, there tend to involve display of compliance, and in this state, one may be said to lead to a more instrumental approach of getting a reward. It may be easy to jump to the conclusion that some of these states of mind are right and others are wrong, but this was not Burns' intention. The main messages of his work are that at any given time, each of us is in one or other of the states of mind outlined. Sometimes the shift from one state to another can be very rapid. One person will tend to respond to another's state of mind. For example, if a manager approaches a member of staff in a critical parent mode, the staff member will tend to adopt a child state of mind, becoming perhaps defensive, dependent, or argumentative. Awareness of both our state of mind and the other persons can help to achieve more effective communication and to develop more positive relationships. Quite often, in work situations, we are asked to work with a group of people we have not met before and with whom we may seem to have very little in common. The group, which may be labeled a team, could be tasked to organize or produce something about which some of the members may know more than others. After a period of initial awkwardness, perhaps the group members start to find out more about each other and attend to their task. It is quite likely that each of the members will then tend to settle into or start playing a particular role for the group based on a mixture of their skills and character traits. For example, someone might offer to go away and find some essential information. Another might draw up a schedule, checklists, or an inventory, while another might start to suggest some different ways of tackling the task. There will inevitably be some vying for particular roles or conflict amongst those members who have differing priorities. A number of management writers have analyzed these situations, and some have developed sets of descriptions for the typical roles people play in them. For example, someone might offer to go away and find some essential information. Another might draw up a schedule, checklists, or an inventory, while another might start to suggest some different ways of tackling the task. There will inevitably be some vying for particular roles or conflict amongst those members who have differing priorities. A number of management writers have analyzed these situations, and some have developed sets of descriptions for the typical roles people play in them. One of the most widely quoted of these was developed by UK academic R. Meredith Belbin. He went on to use this framework successfully in his consultancy work on team building amongst groups of managers. R. Meredith Belbin's view was that in order for a group to become a balanced and effective team, the people within the group must play eight roles between them. The eight roles that the people of group within group must play is defined through its role type, description, and characteristics as it is outlined below. Implementer 
He likes to get on with the team's tasks and sort out practical details. He is dutiful, practical, and quite cautious, predictable, and sometimes inflexible. Coordinator. He encourages team members to make their point, but keeps the team going in the right direction. He is calm, self-confident, and supportive, does not get involved in matters of detail. Shaper. He provides drive and energy to the team's work, but can try to influence it with their own views. He is outgoing, dynamic, challenging, impatient, and sometimes provocative. Plant. He offers lots of imaginative ideas or specialist knowledge to the task. He is creative thinker, often unorthodox, likes to work alone, and not very practical, resource investigator. He provides lots of information and has lots of useful contacts. He is highly communicative, enthusiastic, and curious, easily bored. Monitor, evaluator. He likes to observe and measure how well the team are doing. He is prudent, hard-headed, and a good judge, at times rather you an emotional team worker. He does things to keep up team spirit or morale. He is socially orientated, sensitive, and responsive, sometimes indecisive. Completer, finisher. He makes sure that all tasks are finished off completely. He is painstaking, orderly, conscientious, can be anxious, and find it difficult to let go. These are the eight roles that Belbin stated that led to a balanced and effective team. It is important to bear in mind that Belbin's roles are not something anyone is born into. They do not mean that if you spot one or more of the characteristics in yourself or others, you must maintain a certain role. The roles are rather like acting roles in that they can be chosen and played. Indeed, in many groups of smaller than eight people, some members need to play more than one role, switching between roles according to the needs of the team and the task. Changing roles from time to time is not only possible, but sometimes necessary as we change jobs and teams. Having said this, most people do tend to have a preferred first role, one that they feel most comfortable with. Can you recognize from the descriptions and characteristics from the roles in which you would tend to feel comfortable with? Could you manage to play any of the other roles without too much of a problem?